Brethren, I take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you uh, to this session. It's another Sabbath that God has given us, and uh, we glorify his name for all that he has done for us. And uh, indeed, we have a lot to thank God for. Unfortunately, I, may not, I will not be able to use my video today, but I trust that my sound is clear and can be heard by everyone. So welcome to this session. And uh, I believe others are going to join as we continue. So at this time, I would like to uh, just give uh, two people a chance to greet us. Uh, and then we can proceed. So I'd like first to request Elder Juguna. Welcome. I see you have joined us. You can greet us at this time. Happy Saban. Happy day. Happy happy day. Happy Sabbath. Let us be blessed together and want to welcome uh, Elder Mari for uh, for today's uh, presentation. I don't know whether he has uh, joined. Yes, I can see he has already joined. So, uh, Elder, uh, be blessed and as a waiter, uh, as we wait uh, for you to give us the the manna from heaven. Uh, let's all be blessed and happy Sabbath to all. Thank you. Baba. Thank you so much, uh, Elder Junguna, Baba. and uh, welcome so together Baba. with your family. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Uh, the second person I would like to him to greet us is Brother Kalama, uh, all the way from Malindi, place called Majahazini. So, Brother Kalama, welcome. I request that you can unmute your microphone and greet us at this time. Thank you very much. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Happy day. Happy Sabbath. Now I'm back to Zoom, so let us be, be blessed to all. Amen, amen. I'm glad Thank to see you, you back. Too. Welcome, Brother Kalama, together with your family. Thank you very so, much. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so everyone, welcome. May you have your pens and papers ready to take down some notes. And I remember, as always, at the end of the presentation, uh, you are going to get a chance to ask a question or to give a comment or to seek clarification for any point that you will not have understood. So at this time, I welcome Elder Mare. Thank you, Elder, for finding time for us again. And uh, we are looking forward to being blessed by the thoughts that God has placed in you to share with these people. So Elder Mare, welcome at this time. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Happy day. Happy Sabbath. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen as we seek to begin our study today. Just let me know if you can see the screen. Are you able to see that screen? 
Hello? Are you able to see the screen? I can't hear you. Okay. Yes, you can, you can see the screen. Oh. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. I okay. want to welcome everyone. Okay. I want to welcome everyone. Again, a little feedback. Uh, all right, good. So today we're looking at number three. I said this would be two parts, but the Lord is leading. What I'm discovering is that Daniel, we're living within somewhere between Daniel chapter one and Daniel chapter three. And the events and the experience of the Hebrews in Babylon, as outlined in Daniel chapter 1, is very important for us who live in the days of final Babylon. Because as we look at the beast, on its image. We recognize that the beast was formed in a certain way and the image is similar to the beast. But when the image is fully formed, it will become final Babylon. And then the final message or the second call to come out of Babylon will be given. Therefore, the events and experiences of God's people in Daniel chapter 1 will apply and will become very important, very significant to God's people. Then, in fact, they have become significant right now as a result of what is up ahead. So today, our study, our study sorry, revolves around the seven principles of righteousness as discovered in Daniel chapter one. I invite you to pray with me as we begin the study. Father in heaven, our merciful God and Savior, we thank you so much, Lord, today for this privilege of another study. We invite the Holy Spirit to make these thoughts very plain. And Father, we ask that you will help us to see it in the right light and take nothing for granted. You are indeed preparing your people for final victory. Help us, Lord, to know and believe that this is what you're doing for each one of us, that we may fully cooperate in this final preparation for the final work and the final test. Bless us now. May your Holy Spirit drive these thoughts home to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Unfolding events, the last days of human history Part three, seven principles of righteousness. Now Israel, in Daniel chapter one, Israel was in Babylon. And some very significant things took place as Israel went into Babylon. The Bible says in verse three and four of Daniel one, that the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed. So he was looking for the best, the prime of the Israelite nation and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish but well favored. In other words, they were to look the best and they were to look 
outstanding, well favored, and skillful in all wisdom. So even their mental capacity was to be of the highest quality. Skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge, understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the children. So here was Israel in Babylon, chosen men of Israel or chosen youth of Israel being brought to stand in the Babylonian palace to learn the Babylonian tongue of the Chaldeans. And this learning of the tongue included, was really um, a, a desire of the king to make them Babylonians. This is what it was intended, is that they would represent Babylon. Now, God used Nebuchadnezzar, we are told in the Bible, in the book of Jeremiah 27, verse 6. The Bible says about Nebuchadnezzar's invasion and captivity of Israel. It says, God speaking, and now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. So it was not only the Israelite nation, but all the other nations around Moab and, and Ammon and all those other nations. The Lord said he gave all those lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. My servant. So Nebuchadnezzar was servant of God. Remember that. Further, it says the beasts of the field have I given him also to serve him. So every nation surrounding Israel were given to serve Nebuchadnezzar. Now, what is service? While they were to serve Nebuchadnezzar, they were to fear God. Because the principle in the word of God, we're looking at Colossians 3.22, it says servants. Doesn't matter where you're serving. Once you're a servant, this is a word for you. The word says, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men please theirs, but in singleness of heart. So God is saying that our service to our masters according to the flesh must be of a different quality. It must not be I servers, I servant, those who serve only when the earthly, fleshly boss or masters are wrong. That's I service. Or men pleasers who do things just to please men. But the Bible says in singleness of heart, fearing God. So while they were in Babylon, serving Babylon, they were to fear God. They were to have the fear of God before them. And that would keep them from going overboard while serving Babylon. Because in, order, in other words, everything that is asked of them in Babylon, they were to consider the fear of God. All right. Now, one of the things that we need also to remember is that our reward for our service to man comes from God. So we are to fear God because we are serving God. And our reward comes from God. So the Bible says in verse 23 and 24 of Colossians 3, it says, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, 
knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. So those Hebrews that went into Babylon were serving the Lord Christ and they were to receive, look forward to the reward of the inheritance from God. That is why when the laws of Babylon conflicted with God's law, the, reveal, the Hebrews revealed who they were really serving. Daniel 3, 7, they said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver. In other words, they said to the king clearly that we are serving a God, not you. Now, how is this possible? They were supposed to be serving Nebuchadnezzar. They went into to Babylon to serve Nebuchadnezzar, God's servant. But we must remember, God called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. And if you were to serve Nebuchadnezzar, who is God's servant, then you're really serving God. If the Hebrews were to serve Nebuchadnezzar as the servant of God, then they were really serving God only. And Jesus tells us that we don't have the capacity to serve two masters. The Bible tells us in Matthew 6, 24, Christ says, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in my mind. So therefore, understand what fearing God means is to reverence him above all others. And service to God really means obedience to all the laws of God because the word of God tells us in the book of James, it says to offend in one point is to become guilty of all. So service to God means obedience to all the laws of God. And therefore, you cannot serve God and mama. They couldn't serve God and Nebuchadnezzar at the same time. So they were to serve Nebuchadnezzar as the servant of God. Nebuchadnezzar as the servant of God, therefore, could not put a law that conflicted with the laws of God because he would cease to be the servant of God. And therefore he would forfeit service to himself. Get these principles. Get these principles because we are living in the time of mystical Babylon. We live in between Daniel 1 and Daniel 3. So what is true religion? Christ of the lessons 3, 5, 6, paragraph 3 says, God brought Daniel and his fellows into connection with the great men of Babylon. That these heathen men might become acquainted with the principles of true religion. So that in the midst of a nation of idolaters, Daniel was to represent the character of God. Oh, praise the Lord. So the question is asked, how did he become fitted for a position of so great trust and honor? Why? It says he honored God in the smallest duties. We like to overlook the small duties. We like to think that certain things are not essential. But God says, no. Everything, even the smallest duties, are forming character. character. So Daniel honored God in the smallest duties and the Lord cooperated with him. And that is why Daniel chapter one is so important for us at this time. Number one, therefore, looking at the seven principles of righteousness in Daniel chapter one. Number one, diet. Now we see diet alone when we go through Daniel chapter one. We wanna see seven principles. Only the first one is diet. The Bible says the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. 
so nourishing them for years that at the end thereof, they might stand before the king. Now, remember, Nebuchadnezzar was a servant of the Most High God. And therefore, everything that he does, therefore, must be in harmony with the, the laws of the Most High God. Anytime there's a conflict, the Hebrews were free to refuse what the king was asking of them. And because there was a conflict in diet, the diet of the Hebrews, service to God necessitated a refusal of the king's meat and his drink. Their service to God meant they had to refuse what Nebuchadnezzar was giving them. So diet. And every principle in Babylon, in Daniel chapter 1, was to prepare those Hebrews for victory. And therefore, those principles, as they apply to our time and our day, is to prepare us for final victory. Oh, praise God. So they were being prepared for final victory in Babylon. And we are being prepared for final victory in final Babylon. Testimony for the church, volume 3. Page 491 says, the controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands when, if they had conquered on this point, then they would have had the moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. Oh, praise the Lord. So victory, conquering on this point, it's so important, believers. It is, it is one of the essentials for final victory. It goes on, it says, but those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. So Daniel was to perfect Christian character. Daniel was to reveal Christian character to the men in Babylon, the great men of Babylon. And if we do not perfect it, how can we reveal it? For we are told, as we near the close of time, Satan's temptation to indulge appetite will be more powerful and more difficult to overcome. So we're living in a very solemn time when we need to pay even more attention to appetite, to diet. Number two, purposefulness. A principle of righteousness. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, it says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Purposefulness. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Remember we saw earlier that Daniel paid attention to the small things, believers, small things. Now we are told in the Tower of Ages 382, it says it is the issue of the daily test that determines their victory or defeat in life's great crisis. The issue of the daily test, those same small things that we overpass, we bypass. We think they're of not important, not enough importance that decides and determines victory or defeat in life's great crisis. We have great, a life's great crisis up ahead of us. Our victory or defeat is determined when we can stand firm and purposeful in decision making. No, the word of God has a lot to say about this. We are told, TE 276, paragraph 1, it says, when tempted to the unlawful gratification of appetite, you should remember the example of Christ. Praise the Lord. No, it didn't say Daniel. It said the example of Christ. And stand firm. So in other words, Daniel 
was following the example of Christ. He was being, he was being empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit that was in Jesus Christ. So the example of Christ, and therefore with a stand form, overcoming as Christ overcame. Daniel overcame as Christ had overcome. Now, how does that work? You should answer, it says, saying, thus said the Lord. This was Christ's answer, scripture. Thus said the Lord. And in this way, settle the question forever with the prince of darkness. Firmness. If you parley with temptation and use your own words, this is what Eve did in, in, in Eden. Feeling self-sufficient, full of self-importance, you will be overcome. You will be overcome. So firmness is required in dealing with temptation, whether especially if it is with the appetite. And that's why Daniel was so firm and purposeful. He made a decision and that was it. Our only safety, testimony volume three, 482, paragraph two, paragraph three. Our only safety is in giving no place to the devil. It is unsafe. Wow. It is unsafe to enter into controversy or to parley with him, the devil. Why? For every advantage that we give the enemy, he will claim more. Satan says, I want more. So our only safety is in rejecting formally the first approach to presumption. Form rejection of that approach. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resistance must be firm and steadfast. So when we talk about resist the devil, or do we understand that this must be characterized by firmness and steadfastness? It says we lose all we gain if we resist today only to yield tomorrow. And that's what we do many times, very often. We resist today, but then tomorrow we get it. So we lose all that we have gained when we do that. So with a practice firmness and fixed determination when dealing with temptation. Review on Herod Mark 12, it says we should be as firm as was Daniel, who was following the example of Christ, or who was yielding to the spirit of Christ in controlling the appetites and the desires of the flesh. We must institute a warfare against every sinful inclination and submit to the control of the Holy Spirit. Submit to the control of the Holy Spirit. How necessary it is that every soul bring the solid timbers of righteousness into his character building so that there will be a fixed determination to do right because it is right. A fixed determination to do right because it is right. So we look at diet and we've looked at purposefulness, favor. This is an important principle, favor. The Bible says in verse nine of Daniel one, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the universe. God bring, brought, brought Daniel into favor. Now we might think favor, see favor as um, a real favor. How we see if somebody do something for us has nothing to do with us, but favor has everything to do with you. Let's look at the experience of Samuel, who also it was said that he was in favor. The Bible said the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord 
and also with men. But how does favor really work? Christian education. The question is, how do I make people feel? It has to do with me. Samuel had been placed under the care of Eli. And the loveliness of his character, Samuel's character, is what drew forth the warm affection of the aged priest. He was kind, he was generous, he was obedient and respectful. And thus, as the infirmities of age came upon Eli, and he was filled with anxiety and remorse by the profligate course of his own sons, guess what? He turned to Samuel for comfort. How would he turn to Samuel? Because Samuel had the loveliness of character that could comfort even the aged priest. Favor. So favor has so much to do with us believers. It is a principle of righteousness. What about Daniel? It was the last and most troubling night of Babylon. When the bloodless hand appeared, the writing on the wall of the palace. But the queen who had interacted with Daniel on many occasions, recalled the impression made on her mind by her encounter with Daniel. Her words was, and this is the queen speaking, she says, for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, Daniel chapter five, verse 12. This is the queen speaking. In other words, this was the impression made on her mind and it came back to her on that fateful night, Babylon's last night. How do we make people feel? How do you make people feel? Favor, therefore, is a principle of righteousness. Diet is a principle of righteousness. What we eat, how we eat. Our purposefulness, it's a principle of righteousness. So we need to make right impressions. How do we make right impressions? Gospel workers need to do. Our words, our actions, our deportment, our dress, everything should preach. Not only with our words should we speak to the people, but everything pertaining to our person should be a sermon to them. Why? that right impressions may be made upon them and that the truth spoken may be taken by them to their homes. Thus our faith will stand in a better light before the community. Now listen, understand that Daniel was not making right impressions for himself. It worked for him, but he was there to give the gospel to those heathen men. He was there to represent and to reveal God's character to them. But the character of God is composed of principles of righteousness. And therefore those principles must be, must be seen manifested in his life. That is the work that we have to do. And therefore we cannot escape doing the same thing like Daniel. Having, the right, having those same principles in our life. We have a purpose to fulfill in final Babylon like Daniel had in ancient Babylon. Manuscript three, it says I was shown that I should present before the people in the best manner possible the light received. We don't receive light and then give it out anyhow. 
right impressions must be made. I was to improve everything as far as possible, bringing it to perfection. Do we think like this? Or are we satisfied with mediocre? Bring it to perfection that it might be accepted by intelligent minds. As far as possible, every defect, defect should be removed from all our publications. As the truth should unfold and become widespread, every care should be exercised to perfect the works published. Wow. Fear for evidence that people may read it and want it. They may recommend it, they may see it and recommend it to others. Fear for. Fever is a principle of righteousness. It comes as a result of our perfection. A righteous heart. How do we make people feel? That is the question. Number four, faith. And when we talk about faith, this is the fourth principle, we are not just talking about any faith. We are talking about faith that is pleasing to God. We're talking about faith that is pleasing to God. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 11 to 13, the Bible says, Then said Daniel to Melzar. Melzar was concerned about the request. He says, You will have endanger my head to the king. I can't do this. But Daniel responded. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs, Ashkenaz, had set over Daniel, set over Hananiah, over Mishael and Azariah. Daniel said, prove thy servants, I beseech thee ten days. Now here was Daniel speaking to Melzar. He was pleading with Melzar for an opportunity to give him a fair chance. Remember, he had done everything to bring himself to make right impressions. And God brought him into favor so that when he made his request, it would be considered. We need to think about these things. Then they said, prove thy servants, I beseech thee 10 days. This is confidence in God. God says, you use the diet that I give you, and you will benefit from it. You will appear healthier. People will see that you have a better health. And Daniel, prompted by the Spirit of God, says he did not even, he did not hesitate. It was the Spirit that chose 10 days. Daniel said, I beseech thee, prove us 10 days and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee. This is confidence in God. Let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servant. This is the confidence. This is the faith that pleases God. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11.6, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. What is the kind of faith that we're talking about here? He that cometh to God must believe that he is. You understand that you're coming to God. More than that, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Then you'll have to believe that God will reward his faith before Melzar. He put confidence in the, the word of God, in the, the, the command of God, in the requirements of scripture, where diet is concerned. And the Bible tells us that this kind of faith must be unwavering. In James 1, 6 and 7, it says, whoever asks for anything from God, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. 
for he that wavered is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So the kind of faith that pleases God is the faith that does not waver. The faith that nothing must be wavering. That's not the kind of faith that pleases God. The faith that pleases God is confidence in God. Come to the church for the seven. God requires that we confess our sins and humble our hearts before him. But at the same time, we should have confidence in him as a tender father. Do we put confidence in him as a tender father? Or do we think of him as a tyrant? We are to have confidence in him as a tender father who will not forsake those who put their trust in him. And yet we cannot dishonor God more decidedly than by showing that we distrust what he says and question whether the Lord is in earnest with us or is deceiving. That is dishonoring the God. So there's no, there's no alternative. Our only option is confidence in God as a tender father. That's the only option we have. Christ happy blessing says, God has a heaven full of blessings for those who will cooperate with him. All who obey him may with confidence. Are you obeying God? The Bible says, come boldly before the throne of grace. Come with confidence and claim the fulfillment of his promises. But we must show a firm, undeviating trust in God. God wants that. He wants to see that firm, undeviating trust. It says often he delays to answer us in order to try our faith or test the genuineness of our desire. Having asked, according to his word, we should believe his promise and press our petitions with a determination that will not be denied. So Daniel had to say 10 days and believe that when the 10 days is fulfilled, they will look better. They will, it will be seen that the diet that God prescribed was better. The evidence will be there. Conviction. Does conviction have to do anything to do with that? Conviction is a principle of righteousness. It just depends on how you see it. Conviction. Men are not convicted by themselves. We know that it is the spirit of God that works on the heart and brings conviction. Does it have anything to do with you? Yes, it does. The book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 14 to 60, the Bible says, so he consented. Melzar consented to them in this matter. Remember, Melzar had, and Daniel had already been brought into favor. In other words, his life had revealed principles of righteousness. Melzar loved him and saw him as a good young man. So Melzar consented and proved them 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. So here was something seen added to the consistent life that Daniel was living. So it has brought conviction to Melzar and Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and give them pulse. He was convinced now, the Holy Spirit needs, the Holy Spirit brings conviction, but it needs our example. BTS, Bible Training School, it says it is the unseen worker. Who's the unseen worker? The Holy Spirit. It is the unseen worker standing behind the minister 
who brings conviction and conversion to souls. Now I'm reading pastoral ministry, 148. It says the people who claim to obey the truth are asleep. Their example is not such as to convince the world that they have the truth in advance of every other people upon the earth. So our example must be such as to convince the world. So the spirit of God needs our example. Oh, praise the Lord. So conviction is a principle of righteousness. Conviction to be able to convince others. It is, it is a principle of righteousness because the spirit of God must be able to work through us in such a way by our surrender to truth. But uh, by living out the truth, by our submission to the molding of the Spirit of God, as it speaks through us, that conviction can be safely brought to convince the world. Conviction can be brought to the minds of others. Number six, principle of righteousness, sanctification. Sanctification is a principle that is seen in the life of the believer. He must be sanctified. He must be seen as growing in righteousness. Sanctification is a daily growth in righteousness. There must be seen growth. The Bible says in Daniel 1, 18 and 19, now at the end of the days, that the king had said he should bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them after a period, the period of study, three years. The Bible says, did they grow? Were they sanctified? Had they moved on from the time they came? And the Bible says, and among them, and among them all was found, none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, therefore stood there before the king. These boys, their sanctification was evident. It was evident that they had grown more and more fully up in the world. Listen. It is the living truth that sanctifies the believer. The truth that is lived. We are told in darkness before dawn, page 7, paragraph 1, is that the position that it is of no consequence what men believe is one of Satan's most successful deceptions. You can believe anything, but that's not true. He knows that the truth Received in the love of it, sanctifies the soul of the receiver. Satan knows that. Therefore, he is constantly seeking to substitute false theories, fables, and for another gospel. And another gospel. The truth received in the love of it. Daniel and his fellows loved the truth and embraced the truth. They were committed. And it sanctified the soul their souls. Sanctification is a principle of righteousness and it is seen in every true believer their growth into Jesus Christ is a good. Children can be sanctified. We are told in Adventist home, teach your children to love truth because it is true and because they are to be sanctified through the truth. And fitted to stand in the grand review. What's the grand review? What is the grand review? They're children of the heavenly king. The Bible tells us in Revelation 14, verse 1 and verse 5. The Bible says, I looked. And lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000. Having his father's name written in the forest. And in their mouth was found no guile. For they are without fault before the throne of God. Truth. Love truth because it is truth. 
do right because it is right. This is what children must be taught. Finally, wisdom. And not any wisdom, but divine wisdom. The Bible says in Daniel 1 verse 20. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding, now wisdom, divine wisdom, is a person. According to Proverbs. Well, let's get, let's get through this first. Then we get a proverb. The Bible says in all matters of wisdom, and understand it, that the king inquired of Zen. He found Zen 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Where did they get wisdom? The Bible says in James 1 if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abrid it not, and it shall be given him. Wisdom. God's wisdom is Jesus Christ himself. They had Christ. Those boys had Christ with them. And when they were thrown into the furnace, Christ showed up. He showed himself. In Proverbs 8.35, Jesus was speaking. He said, for whoso findeth me, findeth life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. And Bible tells us before that, he was the wisdom of God. Wisdom was speaking in Proverbs 8. Go through Proverbs 8 and you will see that it was wisdom who was speaking. And the Bible says, wisdom said, whoso findeth me, findeth life. In the book of Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 says, they that be wise, they that have Christ, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. They that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. You have to have Christ in order to do the last work. This is wisdom is a principle of righteousness. It is a principle of Christ himself. Psalm 92, 15 says, to show that the Lord, this is the purpose of wisdom. Wisdom is to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in Christ. That's the purpose of wisdom. God's wisdom is Jesus Christ. Finally, so there must be practical demonstrations of righteous principles in the life of the believer. These are verses 2 7 as we close. It says, true character is not shaped from without and put on. It radiates from within. What do we do with true character? What, we do, what do we do with the tr true principles of righteousness? We witness for others, to others like Daniel did in Babylon. Listen, if we wish to direct others in the path of righteousness, the principles of righteousness must be enshrined in our own hearts. Our profession of faith may proclaim the theory of religion, but it is our practical piety that holds for the word of truth. Practical piety, things that must be seen, demonstrated when pressed, when put to the test. The consistent life, not just talk, the holy conversation, the unswerving integrity. We just saw all of that in these seven principles. The active benevolent spirit, favor. How do we make people feel? The godly example that is needed to bring conviction. These are the mediums through which light is conveyed to the world. These are not my words. These are verses 300 and stuff. These are the medium. So unless we learn and we embrace the seven principles of righteousness as seen in Daniel 1, we will not be prepared for Daniel chapter 2. Oh, believers, may God richly 
bless you as you meditate on these words. And may God help us all as we go forward to be truly prepared for victory, for final victory in the battle with you. God bless you richly. Let us pray. God in heaven, we thank you so much today for your word. Father, we are living in solemn times and we ask that you may have mercy upon your people. How was Daniel fitted for this important honor conferred upon him to be a representative of God in Babylon? Because he paid attention to the small things, the little things. Father, grant that your people will not overlook anything at all. Help us to see that these principles of righteousness as seen in Daniel 1 is important for us to perfect Christian character. Diet is only the first. There's so many others. Oh, Father, give us the grace. Give us the submission. Give us the right mindset. Give us the the, the submission to Jesus Christ, to the molding power of the Holy Spirit, that each one of us will experience perfection of character, that we may be used individually in final Babylon to reveal God's character to the world, to the great men of the earth. Oh, Father, and we thank you for this privilege, this honor that you have conferred upon us. And grant, O oh Lord, that we will make you proud of us, that we will live up to the honor by the mercy and by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.